This is halfway hey, there's a leak full. here. There's a leak here. Are you serious? Oh, sh shut it off, shut it off, shut it off. Shoot. I don't think that's going to work for long. Nah, give it a moment. And yeah. dandelion is not going to plug that <laughs> for long. <laughs> oh, wait, this hurts too small. In today's video, I'm going to share the truth about homesteading. The dark side of homesteading. <laughs> Thank you, son. That's right. We're going to talk about the dark side of homesteading. Just briefly, we're not going to go into great depth on that. In addition to that, today's devotion is going to be some very special lessons that God has taught me while working in the gardens over the years. I think there are so many special lessons that we can draw from gardening. You can learn how to handle people and children by growing a garden. And I think this is one of my favorite special lessons that I have learned from growing a garden. It's a busy, bustling day here at the homestead. It's the day we've been waiting for for quite some time now, and we are going out to plant our cold crops. I'm very excited. Kids are scurrying through their chores and breakfast. We have all of that almost out of the way, and we are about to head out. Gardening, it's one of life's most therapeutic activities in my opinion. I think it's good for the body, it's good for the mind and the soul. I think there are so many special lessons that we can draw from gardening. Gardening is something that is a really special gift you can teach your children how to do. I mean, there's the obvious. Children learn the sciences of gardening and horticulture and they learn how rewarding it is to plant a seed and watch it grow and produce fruit. And their excitement from the time the seed sprouts to the time it starts growing and getting bigger and then the first time it starts producing vegetables or fruit, it's just so elated for them. Speaking of kids though, growing a vegetable garden is a little bit like growing kids. <laughs> they both need nurturing, they need food and tender care. You can learn how to handle people and children by growing a garden. And I think this is one of my favorite special lessons that I have learned from growing a garden. If weeds start taking over, you gotta jump in and protect your plants before it's too late. It's a lot like growing kids. <laughs> and we know from the parable of the wheat and the tares in the Bible that we have to do this in our own lives as well. In the Bible, it tells us to be transformed each day by the renewing of our mind. I think this is a little bit like weeding a garden. You gotta go through and analyze things from time to time and make sure you're still on track. Make sure the weeds in your own life haven't started to take over. For example, going through your beliefs, making sure they align with the scriptures, touching base with God on a regular basis, and making sure you're on the right path. And I think that to a certain extent, it's important for believers to do this with each other as well. If a person or a child has a habit that they have grown to love and it's become a pretty big habit in their lives, you have to be really, really careful. It's the same with beliefs. If a person has a belief, even if it's not true, but they've grown accommodated to it, you have to be careful about how you approach them to uproot that belief. It doesn't say to attack them on social media or publicly. It says to go to them in private and approach them with love. If I went down to my garden and I saw that I had a plant that was completely surrounded in weeds and I started ripping at all of the weeds around that plant, I stand a chance of uprooting the plant and damaging the plant's roots. And if that happens, even if I try to fix it afterwards, that plant might be so traumatized that it never produces fruit again. It could stunt its growth. It can even kill the plant. I think it's similar with people. 
especially children, but everybody. If you go in and you start ripping out thought patterns or weeds or habits in a person's life and you're not gentle about it, you can damage that person and stunt their growth and their walk in the Lord. If you have not love, you take a chance of doing far more harm than good. You know, sin in a person's life needs to be approached with forethought and love. These are little lessons that I always think of when I'm planting a garden and I've started teaching them to my children as well. So every year when we're out weeding, we talk about how we need to take care of the weeds in our own lives, living a life that glorifies God. If you get too close to the rhubarb roots, you'll hurt the root and that will hurt the plant. So you don't want to get too close to the roots. You want to stay somewhat far away. Just get the grass that's growing close to the rhubarb. I am watching my emails like a hawk right now. I'm expecting sometime today, hopefully this morning, the soil test results. We tested four spots of the garden or three. I think three main areas of the garden and the results should be coming in. That is going to be the moment we start planting. In the meantime though, I I don't think it's gonna hurt to go get the rose created and ready to go. We decided to come out and work in our flower bed or our, it's actually more of our herb garden and flower bed right outside our front door while we wait on that soil test result to come through. I wanna show you guys some of what I've used to play on the garden this year. I really have enjoyed this book. One of my sons has been reading through a lot of it. I think he's probably made it over halfway through the book as part of ag. Anyways, this book is awesome. Awesome. It's got a lot of information on each of the varieties of vegetables. So it's been helpful in, as we've been planning our garden this year. I wanted to show you guys what I used to plan our garden this year. I use the Farmer's Almanac Garden Planner. You can get this online. Um, you can do it all on your computer. I think you can also do it all on your phone, but it helps you with companion planting. If you get the membership, which is what I did, it will let you know what was planted or what you planted in a certain area for five years so that you can reduce pests and diseases. So here we are. I have the whole garden plan. It's almost done. This this right here is the major area that you're seeing. I've got all kinds of fun plans here. I still need to finish working out this area. What I'm doing right now is I'm just literally waiting on that email to come in with the soil testing because I may end up moving some of these crops. Like I'm not sure if I want the corn there or not. I just want to make sure the soil is going to be good for the corn. I also want to make sure the soil for the potatoes and the soil for the tomatoes is optimal. So if we have like areas that are more acidic than other Others, I definitely want to make sure to plant the acid loving vegetables in those spaces and if I do have any areas that are more alkaline <laughs> I want to make sure to plant the alkaline loving vegetables in the appropriate areas so that is literally what I'm waiting on today is our potato cutting day we're cutting up Yukons golden Yukons and red Pontiac and over here we're gonna be cutting up some russets getting them ready to plant you want to cut these to about a golf ball size and you want to make sure that each one has a couple little eye buds on it or like these ones are getting away from us here obviously. I went with Yukons and Pontiacs because they're really good for storing and we definitely want a lot of potatoes to store through the winter. I'm hoping we won't have to buy any. I looked it up and how many you want to plant per person. We're a family of eight so I can't remember how much it said to plant. We have over 200 plants we're going to be planting though. <laughs> Yukons and Pontiacs both are a good multi-purpose potato. I researched both of these before I bought them and I know that the Pontiacs are good for chipping, boiling, baking, and mashing I believe. I probably should have got a few more of these russets. I'm headed down to the garden with my first cup of coffee of the morning. I woke up kind of late because I'm not feeling well today. I woke up and I mentioned to the boys we really need to get three more rows of potatoes planted. And before I could even get my coffee done, I looked out the window and look what I saw. They're both down there. Two of them are. One's still eating breakfast. I'm so proud of them. They obviously remembered enough of what I taught them yesterday on how to set the rows. And they're down here getting the rows set. Somebody's camera shy. <laughs> He's hiding. <laughs> Oh, it feels so good out here, you guys. You guys, this is what almost two tons of chicken feed looks like. If anybody tries to tell you that homesteading is cheap, it's not. 
sorry, not sorry, but you need to know the truth. <laughs> before, before you get into it thinking it's going to be something that's going to save you a lot of money and, you know, you get to raise your own food, I'm just going to tell you the honest to God truth. It's expensive. Uh, I think we still do save in the long run only because we're a large family. There definitely are some large costs up front before you get to the part where you really do end up saving money. And so that is kind of where we're at right now, having to invest in a lot of, you know, starter up things like the irrigation system for our garden, barrels for our chicken feed, and certain things that we need for the chickens to raise them. And I just wanted to say that for those of you thinking that homesteading is this romanticized, beautiful life where it's like heaven on earth. You know, it's not. It's a lot of work. Every road has its challenges. This has been a dream of mine and my husband's since we were teenagers, though. We had this dream before we even met each other. Even though there are these startup costs up front that are kind of staggering. We were kind of prepared for it because we were pretty much raised this way. My husband had cows growing up. I had, my family had chickens growing up. So we were actually raised along homesteading lines. It wasn't called that back then. A lot of this is not unfamiliar to us. We tried having homestead in the Midwest, but we just didn't have enough land to do it. And we didn't have affordable feed to do it. Like our garden would constantly get destroyed by the agricultural sprays because we lived in fields of you know major farmland and the, sp the spray would drift onto our garden and kill it all the time so in the midwest it was really hard trying to have a homestead here it's very different you guys it's crazy in the midwest the entire time we were there almost so many things happened where it was like God was trying to get us to come to where we are now again and again and again. It's crazy because once we moved here, our lives drastically turned around. The quality of our days and our weeks improved. And if you are in a place where you just feel like nothing is going right for you, I think it's something to consider. Are you where God wants you? It was really hard to make the choice to pick up and move here. In fact, we made the choice one time before we lost the nerve. We got scared. Moving so far away, uh, for us it was almost 2,000 miles from the Midwest, and it was a big leap of faith. And in 2010, we had the opportunity, but we were afraid to make that leap. Honestly, we suffered for another several years until we couldn't do it anymore. And I woke up one morning and I just said, that's it. And it was crazy because once we got here, it was evident that God was pushing for us to come back here all along. Now there's not a week that goes by where I don't praise him and thank him for where he's brought us. It's almost like we were wandering in the wilderness and now we have come to our promised land and it was a long, hard wilderness journey. <laughs> And it took a toll on us, but I do feel like God is honestly being faithful to his word when he says he will restore what the locust has eaten and rebuild the years that were destroyed. It says this in the book of Joel. You guys, he counts the tears. He really does count the tears. There is not a tear that is wasted in this life that God does not count. Over here. Boy, they got too big. They're not that big yet. They're still little fuzzballs. Raisin. The one with a white beak is raisin. Raisin? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going away. Raisin. We are going to be making comfrey compost. Apparently my oldest son remembered our water fight last year. I'm soaking wet right now and he... <laughs> I missed it, but he was laughing like a maniac. What's your bracelet say? I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. All right, we got some comfrey. This is this is halfway hey, there's full. Here. There's a leak here. Are you serious? Oh, shut it off! Shut it off! Shut it off! Shoot! I don't think that's going to work for long. Nah, give it a moment. And Hang dandelion on. is not going to plug that <laughs> for long. <laughs> oh wait, this is getting smaller. Anyways, once we can find another barrel, we're gonna refill it with the comfrey and water and let it ferment for how many days? I just can't remember. Was it like a month? The finger. You look under it. I'm looking at my fine. I don't see anything. All right. Other side. Now we need. Oh. 
wild strawberries. There's probably like, oh, I don't know, 12 little bushes in this little area. You can eat the invisible strawberries. Okay, come on kids, I'm gonna show you something else over here. Well, Sunday morning when I was out here, I found something growing. I'll Don't show you what it is. Okay, I'll show you. See this area right up in here? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. There are thorns on these, so you don't want to go in them because they will hurt, but you know what these are? Ah. These are wild roses. They're gonna make beautiful pink ah. roses. Probably in about three weeks. They'll probably start in June. They're called June roses. Mom! Look at these. No, but I'm serious. Okay. Another one was 25 pounds per acre. I am on top of a mountain, way out in the mountains, closer to like halfway between. So you probably wouldn't recommend it. If I do the borax, it sounds like it's a much better idea to do it like in the fall when I'm going to be tilling. So I just got off the phone with the soil test people and the guy said yes I absolutely can use borax so you can use borax if your garden needs boron the only problem is that you can really overdo it quickly borax is 11% boron and you can kind of poison your soil with too much boron he said as little as it needs he would probably just skip it another plan of action is to put it on next year or actually at the end of this year for next year um, so I think that's what we're gonna do and we're only gonna need a box and a half of borax and it should be enough to restore what's depleted in the soil and if we overdo it it will have the winter to kind of uh, not disintegrate but water down I guess a little bit but it won't won't a whole lot this portion of the garden right in here I think it needed only a half a pound of sulfur down there it needs I believe a pound of sulfur and get this over here where the soil isn't nearly as good it needs 25 pounds of sulfur and that's per acre they smell good i know they smell good ah. <laughs> just today i was wondering when you were going to find these because i knew they were about to start blooming it was just today and was... we found them out in the yeah forest. you found them yeah we got more flowers together this is called a super trooper yellow dianthus can you say dianthus mm -hmm. you can <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Will you say Dianthus? I don't know. <laughs> take it out? No, we gotta take it out of the pot. Like this. Oh. We gotta take it out first. See? There you go. Yeah. Now we gotta put, yes, put the dirt all around. Oh, let's get the spoon out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be using a spoon right now if you hadn't lost the shovel. You keep an eye out for that shovel, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. Here we go. How pretty. I don't see these now, ones. Now you gotta put this down so we know what it is. Put it. Go ahead and put that one in the soil now. Put it in a little spot. That's called a petunia. Can you say petunia? Petunia. Petunia. Mm -hmm. Now all summer long, you get a look at these and we get, <laughs> what is he doing? <laughs> You're on camera. What are you doing? <laughs> well, we don't need to, so we'll just take this one. Also, we, you know what we can use and save these? Okay. Do you, know where, do you know where the rest of these are in the garage? In the garage? You don't? Okay, well let's go put them in there together then. Let me get this spoon cleaned off. Please keep an eye out for the shovel that you ran off with. Um, can you? Do you see how there's all that white on there? Those are the roots. They look like hairs, don't they? Do you see how you can see so many of the roots? Can you say root bound? Root bound. Root bound. Okay, go ahead. You can put it in if you want to. Put all the dirt around it. Did you watch that show with us? That show? So you saw how they put the dirt around the plant. I can see you must have learned it somewhere. Good job. <laughs> 